Okay, um, welcome back everybody. Um, I'm really excited about um, this next session and I hope it'll be particularly useful for all of you. Um, it's basically about doing journalism in places where that is increasingly hard. Um, for many of you, you are reporting in places that work, rank among the worst um, on the Global Press Freedom Index. Um, I know I've heard from a lot of you about uh, frustration simply in getting people to answer really basic questions. Um, and so we're gonna have two perspectives here today. Um, one is from Matthew Campbell. Matthew is a reporter and editor with Bloomberg Business Week. Um, very prolific. Um, he's written a number of um, in-depth and investigative pieces. And he's also the author of Dead in the Water, a nonfiction book about hijacking and global maritime conspiracy. I've not read it yet, but I do find that very intriguing. I may have to pick it up. Um, and then we are, we're also welcoming Zad Asta. He is the head of content for Rice Media, which is an alternative uh, news site here in Singapore. Please let's give them a warm hand. Uh, so I think I'm going to start. Uh, hi, everyone. Welcome to Singapore, for those of you who come uh, from far away. Uh, so as Anne mentioned, yeah, I do uh, complex, generally investigative features, either as a reporter or editor uh, for Bloomberg, based here in Singapore, but covering Asia. And uh, I'm here to talk about, yeah, doing, doing tough reporting in places where it's difficult. I have to issue a few disclaimers before I get too deep into the topic, uh, and you know some of them involve acknowledging a fair degree of privilege, which is a, a very common uh, thing to, to do these days. Um, look, I'm a citizen of a Western country. I work for a big international media organization uh, with a ton of resources. I uh, have worked in some some very tough countries, but I've never lived in them. Uh, I've always lived in places like uh, France or the UK or, or indeed Singapore, where you can go back to uh, at the end of the reporting trip. Uh, and, and that puts you in a different situation from uh, actually living in, in the place where you are doing uh, the tough reporting. Um, so I just don't have the same constraints and, and certainly not the same risks that others run, uh, particularly in, in countries that are lower down on the press freedom scale. Uh, but I think I have picked up some, some useful knowledge and, and some tactics that hopefully uh, apply whatever your personal circumstances, which I will try to impart uh, in a brief chat, and then we can do Q&A, which is always far more interesting than me just yakking at you. Um, so I asked Dan to send around this, this story about Turkmenistan, uh, which I did with a colleague uh, who's based in Japan uh, last year. It was part of a package we did on methane uh, that has thankfully won a bunch of awards, uh, mostly due to the hard work of people other than me. Uh, and the, um, basically, so this is about Turkmenistan, which I'm sure we have no one here from Turkmenistan because Turkmenistan is just about the most closed country in the world. Uh, it's like North Korea level closed, or, or very close to North Korea anyway. Um, and yet, you know, we did this big story that uh, I think was reasonably successful and, and got inside the place a bit. Uh, and the big lesson there is the power of open source, first of all. Um, I think there's, there are very good reasons that uh, a lot of news organizations, you know, led by the New York Times and others, are hiring visual investigations people because there is so much information that uh, you know you used to need to be the CIA to get, uh, or, or even then they couldn't get it, and now is easily available. Uh, so in this case, the basis of this story was uh, actually commercial satellite imagery, not, not in the Google Maps sense, but, but in the, the very specialized sense by a company that does uh, surveillance of greenhouse gas emissions. And even if you are the uh, reclusive, extremely eccentric dictator of Turkmenistan, uh, you can't shoot down the satellites. So we got this company to share some of their findings with us, uh, which were really remarkable. Uh, and I think there are some other great recent examples of open source reporting uh, that have been incredibly successful. Like one that I was really impressed by in the kind of wish I did it box was what the Wall Street Journal did on illicit oil transfers to North Korea. Uh, a lot of that was done with commercial vessel tracking data, which you can just buy. Uh, 
uh, and, and is frankly not that hard to get. There's a fair bit of it that's even available freely. Um, another uh, wonderful example, which I absolutely love, and I think I sent <clears throat> Anne um, a tweet thread. Do you have the, the Navalny thing? Oh, I, oh, we don't have that okay, on don't the worry presentation. About it. So uh, Alexei Navalny, the Russian opposition leader, extremely brave guy who's, who's now in jail. So his foundation do a lot of investigative reporting in Russia uh, and on corruption specifically. They recently did an extraordinary piece of work uh, trying to determine that a very large yacht impounded in Italy belonged to none other than the big guy, Vladimir Putin. Uh, and they did it completely open source. Uh, basically, they got... Uh, landing documents from this vessel, which are not terribly hard to get from any port authority, which listed the names of the crew uh, and the nationalities, because this is partly an immigration document. Turns out they're all Russian. That's unusual for a yacht, isn't it? Uh, it also turns out in Russia that uh, there's terrible data security in Russia, and you can search databases of leaked personal information extremely easily, which probably raises some ethical concerns, but in this case, it definitely was worth doing. Uh, and they found out that a lot of these guys worked for not just the Russian security services, but specifically the FSO, which is Putin's personal bodyguard agency. Again, all open source, accomplished in one of the most repressive countries in the world. And, you know, by God, it sure looks like it's Putin's yacht. Uh, so that was incredible. Um, you know, the other big thing that I think is, is really important to think about in any investigative project is uh, the international nexus. How can you approach this story from an angle that lets you use uh, people and resources in countries that are not as restrictive? Uh, and I always try and do that uh, whenever I'm working in a, in a difficult environment. So um, there's a really, like the really basic way to think of this is talk to diplomats. You know, they're not bound by the constraints of operating in say China uh, or, or Pakistan or wherever in the same way that locals might be. Um, another one that I love, uh, and I think is just crucial for any investigative reporter to get a handle on, are uh, U.S. court filings. Uh, you know, America, thanks to uh, you know a lot of very long-standing traditions, has the most accessible court system in the world. Uh, there is something called Pacer, which some of you may be familiar with. Uh, there are also things like Westlaw, which are versions of Pacer that are sold by third parties. Uh, and basically anything that enters a federal court anywhere in the United States is accessible, searchable. Every document that is entered into the record goes on to the system called PACER. Uh, you can uh, download them, you can keep them. You have to pay a very nominal fee, like we're talking a few dollars to get uh, access to documents. Uh, and all you need is a login from PACER, which anybody can get. I think uh, I actually had to fact check this for my book. I think three million people have access to it. Uh, it takes like 20 minutes to sign up. That's it. So anything that's ever touched a U.S. court, which is a hell of a lot because uh, there's lots of lawsuits that end up in the U.S. or U.S. prosecutors go after issues extraterritorially. That is an enormous, incredible resource. Um, the other thing to say is that um, there are uh, other open source resources or, or other, um, sorry, let me, let me, Go back a bit. Um, the other thing uh, that I found useful in the past are things like UN reports. Uh, the UN produces a lot of paper, uh, as do other international organizations. They, again, are not bound by the same constraints that people in country might be. Um, and then uh, you know, we come to something that's trickier, which is finding those motivated to talk and looking for ways to protect them. Uh, in the Turkmen example, I did make contact with a few people in the country, uh, which was very challenging and uh, involved a lot of use of signal and, and other uh, secure communication channel pseudonyms. Uh, you all know the operational security practices as well or better than I do, uh, but you can find the people. And I think that um, there are ways to convince them, to motivate them uh, and to protect them. And, and often it doesn't work, but uh, it can be really worth it even for the few times when it does work. Um, you know, the other thing I would add, uh, just as a final point on general strategy, is that um, even really closed societies can be open in surprising ways. Uh, one of my favorite example is uh, these Russian data leaks. You know, that in this incredibly repressive country, 
Uh, you can uh, get downloaded copies of people's leaked phone contact lists on the internet, uh, which is just incredible to me. You know, Singapore, uh, which is a country that, that certainly uh, has some restrictions on, on the press, um, does have things like ACRA, uh, which is a searchable database of every company incorporated here. It's incredibly useful. Uh, if you're looking into the money that flows through Singapore, uh, ACRA is a very good place to start. Uh, we have open court hearings in Singapore. Uh, there are, there's pretty good access, I believe, actually to property records, although I'll need someone to show me how to do that someday. Um, so that's just an example I happen to know well, but, but there can be these surprising uh, possibilities where uh, you can actually access a fair bit of information, even in places where it seems like it would be difficult. Um, you know, the other, th the, the final point I will make before handing it over uh, to Zat is I don't want any of this to obviate uh, the real challenges of doing uh, independent reporting and especially investigative reporting in difficult countries. And that's especially true if you don't have a major media organization behind you. Uh, you know, the journalists who get killed every year and the Committee to Protect Journalists and others put out information on this are not people who work for CNN or the New York Times, with rare exceptions. Uh, they are independent reporters or reporters working for small publications in, in difficult parts of the world. Um, and, you know, at the risk of stating the obvious, uh, you just have to know the limits. And sometimes they're not worth going over them. Uh, there is absolutely no story worth getting killed over. Uh, there might be some stories that are worth going to jail for, but uh, I would struggle to think of any. Um, you know, we're, I think we're unfortunately living in a bit of a time of, of democratic backsliding, where uh, this is just the way things are going to be for the foreseeable <clears throat> future. And uh, there's only so far you can go, at least in certain cases. Um, so with that, I will stop talking, hand over the uh, virtual microphone, and uh, we can pick it up in the Q&A. Does this mean I'm on? Oh, it is. <laughs> <laughs> uh, hi, everyone. My name is Zat. And uh, OK, I will do the clicker. Uh, OK, that's me. <laughs> so uh, my name is Zat. And uh, I'm currently the head of content for Rice Media. So I, I realized that I didn't put in a slide to explain Rice Media. So I will try to explain it now. So uh, of course, in Singapore, you know, there's, uh, there's the, the typical broadsheet, Straits Times Today Online. Uh, I want to say mothership. OK, I'll say mothership. Uh, and uh, some other uh, uh, independent publications. So uh, we at Rice, we are one of, we are in Singapore, people call us the independent media. I'm not really sure what that means. Uh, and I don't think people do either. So, uh, but we just do what we can do. Uh, it's quite uh, significant that we're here perched on the 25th floor of this building, right? Overlooking this beautiful scenery, right? Uh, so I'll just let you know what we do based on this scenery. So when you look at the veneer of Singapore, right? You, all, you, all visitors see is a very shiny sheen, right? It's clean, it's safe, it's everything seems to be on the up and up, right? So what we do is figure out what has gone wrong and really go there. So if, for instance, we're looking at a building, we look at the people behind the building and how they got there, uh, whether they have family, whether they have anybody who has died, uh, how did they get there, uh, things to that effect. So that is essentially what we do. We do long form narrative storytelling. And by long form, I mean long form, like 2,500 words. Uh, I tell my writers, you know, stick to 1,005. You know, this is all uh, lies. 1,005 is impossible to get based on the stories that we do. Uh, but if people are saying that, oh, Singaporeans don't read, uh, I have actual proof that they do. And I will give you the proof later. So in, in short, that's, my, uh, that's what I do. Uh, I have some of my writers at the back. So they are here to hear what I have to say. Not like as if you all have never heard it before. Lah. Yes. So uh, let's go on. So I'm going to introduce a little bit okay, about how we, how, how we at RISE, uh, how I guide my, my, my writers right, to write all these uh, brave pieces, which I will show you later. So, of course, it always starts with a pitch, right? So, we always pitch with purpose. And I'm saying this because when we talk about press freedom in Singapore, people are always talking about 
aren't you afraid the government is going to like arrest you? When I go on podcasts, people, uh, the, the podcast host will ask, uh, are you sure we can say this? Then I say, I'll tell them, I already publicized that I'll be on this podcast. I'm sure someone from the government is listening. I am quite certain. Uh, and they're like, and you're okay? Say, I'm okay because I'm right. I don't lie. My, my, my point when, when, uh, uh, when I talk about anything with regards to content, right, is all uh, airtight. So uh, do I worry about being jailed uh, or being hauled? I, say, I, I tell my writers, yes, I do. But if I do, bring the social media person along so that we can do a video of it, right? <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, so uh, and, 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 and how it starts is to pitch with purpose. Uh, most people, when you talk about press freedom in Singapore, right, they always look at uh, activists who are saying that, oh, there's no press freedom, uh, uh, you cannot put up a cardboard with a smiley face and then you get arrested and things like that. So this is how we avoid such things. So the first, it starts with pitching with purpose and making sure that the story that my writers do have a bit of meaning. It's not sensational. I'm not here to chase after sensationalism. I'm not here to get people to, like, to, 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 to have a clickbait article and go like, oh my God, I'll click on it. You know, I want a story that is meaningful. I want a story that will change lives. I want a story that gives voice to the voiceless. And God knows there are so many of them in Singapore. Because of this sheen that we have created, every time, uh, uh, every time someone from a less, uh, uh, from a less well-off community uh, uh, does something or, or, or is suffering, right? We don't get to hear them because this sheen covers everything. It's difficult, but that's what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to find those stories and figure out how to tell the stories for them because they don't have the excesses that we have. Reporting respectfully means that we don't, like I said earlier, we don't sensationalize. We don't uh, uh, do uh, rhetorics. We don't uh, exaggerate. Uh, I don't, we try not to do all the uh, fallacies, the factual fallacies. We try to report it as it is. The hard, the hard part about this, right, is that sometimes as writers, we want to put in a point that we think is appropriate. You know, we want to put in a bit of our own agenda in, in, in that sense. And uh, it's very tempting. Uh, so sometimes when I see this sort of paragraphs in my writer's works, I will always question and ask, like, to what end do you want to put this sentence? Who are you trying to, what are you trying to prove? Do you really need to put so much of yourself in the piece? Uh, and that comes down to uh, ensuring that the only people, the, the, the only people that matters are the people whose voices you want to amplify. You are but a fly on the wall and you're trying to bring this story out to people. So that's how we do the reporting. Uh, define the boundaries of a voice, meaning that uh, I, I try not to put I try to get my writers not to put so much of themselves inside. So even if they believe a certain thing, I try not to. I try to tell them, don't put so much of yourself. Uh, maybe find an interviewee that can uh, exemplify that 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 point for you. But if you cannot find any interviewees to exemplify that point for you, then you probably have no point to begin with. And that is difficult for some writers to accept, you know, because we are. We can be a little bit egoistic with some of the writings that we do. We're like, oh no, how dare you change my writing? I've had enough of that. So whenever people write for me and I want to change things, right, I always get uh, uh, pushed back. But I try to tell them I'm not trying to uh, curb your voice. I just don't want you to go to jail. So those are the things that we deal with on almost a daily basis. I will show you some of the pieces later. So this is why empathy in investigative journalism or why Rice Media still exists today. So I'm going to show you three pieces that we have done, which I thought repre best represents the kind of work that we do. So the first one is this, drained and gaslit, junior doctors in Singapore have nothing left to give. So this story is written by one of my writers, Nicole, who is at the back. You can go and uh, grill her about it later, this lady here. So uh, this piece took three, three months to do because she spoke to six junior doctors. And when it comes to this story, that the reason why this story is so enticing, right, is because the, the world of junior doctors in Singapore is so secretive. They don't, they cannot speak to press. They, they cannot speak to press, they, be, they have to be anonymous. And some of them are very scared because most of them are on bond, right? So they are afraid that if they say something, uh, MOH will find out and MOH will, MOH will trace the source. So the six people who spoke to Nicole for these stories are 
such brave people. But I would have to say that in doing this story, it is very easy for us to blame uh, a ministry for it. Uh, because they do hold the power of ensuring that their work schedules are done correctly, ensuring that they get enough rest. But that is not what I'm concerned with. What I'm concerned with is the, are the junior doctors who are going into operation theatres, who, who are not well rested and uh, really are at wit's end because they really cannot do anything except just live out their tenancy. They really cannot do anything. If they, if they leave, they have to pay. They have to pay some sort of bond. So this story is, a, I think, is a great example of how we try to talk about a bigger issue uh, that is facing, that, that a ministry in Singapore is facing, but without addressing the ministry. So what we are focused on instead are the people, the actual people who are suffering uh, behind closed doors, behind closed theatre doors, operating theatre doors. So this is the first story. This was very good. This had very good uh, response. Uh, yeah, and I judge it because a lot of people on Reddit are talking about it. Yeah. The next one is by my uh, editor, uh, Ed, who talks about the sex workers in Geylang, Red Light District, who has no job because of COVID. And this was a very long investigation because he has to go down and speak to uh, all these uh, sex workers. One would think that it would be difficult to speak to sex workers because they'd be like a little bit more closed off, right? But actually, that's not really the case. They are quite willing to share their stories with us. But up till today, uh, the, the restrictions have not been officially lifted from brothels in Singapore. So uh, some of these sex workers are still uh, uh, suffering from the effects of COVID uh, lockdown. Uh, and we are, we are doing another story soon about how some sex workers are paying, uh, asking, are getting services paid with crypto, cryptocurrency because they are smart. Uh, yeah, so this story is interesting for me as well because we are really going down to speak to all the uh, sex workers, and it, it is a little bit of a, a commentary on uh, sex work in Singapore, which is legal but with some caveats but legal so this is an interesting story uh, the next one is my story so this is this story is something that came up in july uh, 11 years of noise terror how one man holds a haugang block hostage so this piece ah oh, so difficult to write uh, it took me four months to write this piece because i had to camp out be, uh, outside the, 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 at the block opposite of the resident. Uh, and this lady has been uh, belingered by this, has been bothered by this neighbor for close to 11 years. He's just knocking on her, 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 her door. I said, uh, knocking on his wall, which they share the same wall, and he's just knocking, knocking, knocking uh, throughout the night from 3 to 4 a.m., 10 to 12 p.m., sometimes 6 a.m., sometimes 5 a.m. And I have a lot of empathy for this kind of stories because. I think if this was me, I will move house. I will buy another house. But I am of a, I'm, of, I'm speaking from privilege because she is living with a family and she's single. So because of the government's housing laws, right, it's so hard for her to buy another house. Uh, so this story is very sensitive because I told the lady, I said, you have spoken to almost every government agency in Singapore, except CPF, except IRAS. I accept the, the government taxes, except uh, CPF, which is our retirement fund. Uh, she has spoken to everyone and no one has helped her. Uh, I have all the emails. Uh, I, have all the, I have all the emails. I have all the transcripts. I have all the CCTV cameras. And someone who is not careful about the kind of things that they write, they will be very quick to jump on the bandwagon and say, this is why the government is not doing a good job. This is why the government should be this. This is why the government should be that. Prior, a few days prior to this piece being published, she gave me a CCTV camera, a CCTV footage of one of her ministers coming to her house to visit and to say hi. So days before this, so she, 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 she sent it to me. Uh, and yet we still survive. I have the emails. I did email uh, SPF, MO, uh, 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 HDB, uh, MND, all the town councils. I did email them and only SPF replied. So... I suppose I've done my job. 
to ask for government uh, to, uh, to, uh, to, uh, to ask for government response, right? So I think this kind of story is, this was one of the most sensitive stories and uh, it is sensitive because nobody knew that I was writing about it except for one other writer. So when it was published, it was published very independently. And this went really, really viral because people, people get angry when you, get, uh, uh, when, when you hear these kind of stories. But uh, as I said, this is an example of how I try to shine the spotlight a little bit more on the people who are suffering because there are two people who are suffering. One is the lady who lives beside the noisemaker. The other one is a couple upstairs. And the couple upstairs gave, told me this one line, which I thought was so poignant. He said, how can I have a baby with this kind of noise? How do I give, how do I help my wife who might go through, who will go through pregnancy and maternity, right? And, man, and make sure that she's not feeling stressed. How? I can't, I can't do that, Zai, and I can't leave. I'm stuck here. These are the people for whom Rice Media uh, exists for. Uh, so while press freedom here is uh, debatable, I feel like how we get around it is by focusing solely on the stories and on the people whose stories we want to tell. And if we are very clear and focused on that objective, I don't think, I think it will be okay. I really think it will be okay. But of course, that means there's a bit of censorship going on, right? But uh, life like that in this country, I cannot do anything about it. <laughs> yep. Uh, yeah, so how we do it is, so I have this uh, thing that I haven't shared with anyone yet. So I call it the bloom formula, right? So you bloom from the story, from the people, and from the intention that you want to bring out. Uh, this is how we manage sensationalism. Uh, resist baseless rhetorics. Getting readers angry with hyperbole is effective, but adds nothing to the discussion. And what's, important, what's more important for us is to offer possible solutions because if I am just putting an article out and I'm ranting and ranting and ranting about things, uh, I am not part of the solution and I want to see Rice Media as part of the solution. So when the ministers behind closed doors are talking about, hmm, let's see how we can re-look re at the law surrounding transgender teens in schools. Right? I want them to pull out an article from Rice Media and say, you see, see what these people are saying. Is this something that we can implement? I, re I, do, I refuse to be that person right, that just talks, 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 talks without proper solution because I think we have a lot of that in Singapore already. So we don't want to be part of that, uh, of that uh, rhetoric. We just want to be more practical. So if we're not offering solutions, then what else are we offering? other than insights. And if I don't think insights are sufficient in Singapore. I have not written like internationally like Matthew, but in Singapore. Yeah. And that's the empathetic newsroom telling stories that matter. That's how we do it at Rice Media. Please visit our website. It's ricemedia.co. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Yeah, hi, my name is Shikumar, I'm from New Delhi. So I wanted to ask you, ask you about the Turkmenistan story that you did. Uh, how did you delegate you know, work on that particular story with your co-author? So, and also, you know, have you done any investigative stories uh, in Singapore about where government was involved? So on uh, question number one, uh, the same way I, I do every joint, project, and, and this is true for you know, a relatively short uh, magazine story, and also for, for my book, which came out recently, which I also did with the co-author, uh, we just divide up based on who has the best relationship, who's the geographically closest, uh, who has the most subject matter expertise. In that case, uh, Aaron, my, my co-writer on the Turkmenistan piece, is a real methane head. Like he, he knows all about the science. Uh, so I was very happy to, to give that part to him and I would focus on the politics and the, and the more human side of it. Uh, so that's, it, it's case specific, I would say, depending on uh, which collaborator has the skill set for a given task. Um, I haven't done a lot of work about Singapore specifically. Uh, I did a story um, that came out earlier this year about a uh, very large investment scam that mm -hmm. collapsed here. 
uh, which was kind of a crazy tale in that some very, very, very sophisticated people had lost a lot of money with this and, and people who should have known better uh, in retrospect. Uh, and you know, I'm happy to say there were no issues uh, there. Uh, that's my, my one and only experience of, of investigative reporting in Singapore so far, and it was totally fine. So I, I think as Zat was saying, uh, you know, there are uh, certainly challenges for particularly journalists in Singapore covering domestic stories. Uh, internationally, there's no challenges at all. I mean, we're, we're very comfortable here. And there's a reason that so many large media organizations do have big international footprints here. Uh, but uh, clearly it's possible because uh, I've been able to do it and, and others have as well. So I think uh, Singapore is a great place to be in many, in many respects. So could you please uh, explain a bit, you know, how you approach that story, which particular parts uh, you focused on and how you got those uh, sources and, and, and data? The uh, nickel scam? Uh, the Turkmenistan. Oh, the Turkmenistan. Uh, yeah, so um, it, originally uh, Aaron, my co-author, had made contact with this company in Canada who do this uh, surveillance uh, of uh, greenhouse gas emissions. He asked them to share with us some data, which they did. Uh, and then from there, we had a great opening scene, right? Because if you can uh, document the moment mm -hmm. when this company figured out that one of the biggest uh, emissions releases ever anywhere was going on in real time, uh, that's a hell of a moment. Uh, and so it would, I'm, I'm a narrative guy primarily. And, and you know, so we asked them, like, so where were you? Where were you sitting? Who actually found it? What happened next? Uh, how did you escalate this? Who did you tell? So that was kind of, we actually got that fairly early. Uh, and then we thought, well, that's a hell of a data point and a great scene. So from there, I started um, <laughs> doing a few things. Um, I am a big fan of LinkedIn Premium, uh, which you should all pay for and mm -hmm. uh, expense, if at all possible, um, because LinkedIn Premium opens up <clears throat> the, excuse me, the advanced search options. Uh, <clears throat> so I spent like two days just searching LinkedIn for anyone who had Turkmenistan in their CV, essentially. Uh, <clears throat> and it turns out that there were a lot of people and some of them were dead and some of them, you know, had been there and, and were just working on, a, on an oil rig and never uh, saw anything or, or met anyone. Um, but eventually you can boil it down to, in this case, four or five people who really did know something uh, and knew people who knew stuff. So uh, I started that. I did get a couple you know, emails back, like, this is my husband's email. He died a year ago. Please never contact us again, uh, which is not great. Um, but yeah, so I found some of these oil people, mostly oil, some other industries who've been there. Um, then I started working on embassies, diplomats. Uh, again, LinkedIn is a good way to find that. But I also asked diplomats I know if they knew anyone who'd been in Turkmenistan, contacted a bunch of them, uh, tried all the exile groups, of which there are a few because uh, in, in the Turkmen case, political opposition in country is basically non-existent. So to the extent there is any uh, independent political organizing and certainly independent media, uh, it's in Vienna or Istanbul or other places. So I made contact with them and, and they could help me get information from inside the country. So, you know, no one thing ever does the job, but, but you can eventually build up a mosaic, uh, even in a really repressive place that you can't visit. Uh, this was actually a great story to do in COVID. Uh, because normally uh, I travel for every story and I was devastated by COVID. It's like, what the hell am I supposed to do? But actually, Turkmenistan is equally inaccessible, uh, whether it's a pandemic or not. So it didn't matter. Um, just uh, two quick questions, one for, um, for Matthew and one for Zat. Um, Matthew, you talked about um, you know, your privilege. You talked about being parachuted into different locations to report. Um, this is a general question about how um, you know, big media corporations um, develop or don't develop uh, local talent. Um, I had a friend who was a reporter in Kenya for the uh, New York Times, and there was some criticism about her reporting because the Kenyans felt that she was insensitive to their um, sensibilities following a uh, terrorism attack a few years ago. She eventually left the country because of um, so just outraged by the way she reported on that case. Um, so when you think about you know, parachuting um, reporters to a region as opposed to developing local talent um, that can report on their own regions. And for, um, for that, 
the uh, doctor story that you mentioned, um, I mean, Singapore seems like a very small place. Uh, how confident are you that your sources are not easily identifiable? And are you worried about repercussions from the hospital or from the ministry um, if your sources are in fact identified? Okay. First. How sure am I that they are unidentifiable? I think when it comes to any uh, stories, we try our best. Uh, I, I don't think I can 100%, 100% say, yes, you won't be identifiable, but I try my best. So we, uh, the, it goes through several people, uh, that story itself. So it moves through the publication with several people. And uh, we do give the story to the sources because our stories, they are this sensitive. We send the story, I said, and tell them, this is what we have written. Uh, the parts, uh, as, uh, specifically the parts that's relating to them, and we ask them whether you're comfortable, do you think that you will be identifiable based on all these things that you're saying? But I think for that particular story, uh, I don't think they care. Because they were so angry and so frustrated with the whole situation that they so willingly spill everything that they know. Uh, in fact, after that story came out, uh, another media publication did another story uh, pertaining to that and they got an actual doctor on the record, on video, which was so strange for me. So I was asking my writer, Nico, say, how come they can get him to be on the record? What, what, what's, 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 what's the difference? So that's how we see the kind of stories that we do and how it affects the general uh, reception or, or the courage of certain uh, interviewees to come forward. So that's the first question. The second question is, of course, about uh, whether we get repercussions from hospitals and ministries, right? Uh, of course, there's a worry for that, but we, I, when I'm editing the story, I made sure not to malign anyone. So I focus, really focus on what the doctors are feeling. And they are not lying when they're telling me because all the, all the, uh, all the, uh, uh, it's all, it, it, they all corroborate. It's all the same. Everyone is, everyone is telling us the same thing, of course, in varying degrees of difference. Just varying degrees. So uh, I'm not about to come out. And then at that point in time, there was a story that just came out uh, on, uh, from Wake Up Singapore where they did a story uh, where they posted a, an unverified news about a baby being, about a miscarriage that happened in one of the hospitals in Singapore. So I was very careful not uh, to make sure that we don't, uh, we don't uh, paint the hospitals in any more bad light than we need to. So I suppose that's how I made sure that the story is not uh, too, too offensive to ministries and to hospitals. Yeah. But after that story came out, as a last point, after that story came out, uh, so many people on Reddit uh, started to share their own stories just to corroborate. So that means that we are, we, I feel safe that, okay, we are right. You know, if they come up and they say, right, actually, this is all not true, this is all rubbish, uh, then I'll be a bit worried. Yeah. On to you. Um, so your question about parachuting in, I think, is a really, <clears throat> really good one and one I struggle with a bit. Um, I think there are a lot of foreign correspondents have not distinguished themselves over the years uh, in, mm -hmm. in some of these situations. And... Uh, if you've ever read Scoop, the Evelyn Law novel, uh, that sort of satirizes this at its absolute worst. Um, I try and work with local reporters whenever I can. I'm very fortunate to work for Bloomberg, which has a bureau just about anywhere you can think of, uh, typically staffed with very brilliant uh, local journalists as well as foreigners. Uh, the last thing I want to do is to be the white guy who comes in and, and bigfoots the people who've been covering a story day to day, you know, for months or years. Uh, that said, you know, there are some places where it's really challenging, like China. Uh, according to Chinese law, Chinese nationals in China may not work as reporters for international news organizations. Uh, they have to be called news assistants uh, and are not allowed to do independent reporting. Uh, that, of course, means that in China, it's all about foreign correspondence in the, in the very traditional sense. Uh, although obviously the news assistants do a huge amount of work and, and frankly, no international media organization could function in China without its Chinese national staff. So uh, yeah, I try and collaborate as openly as possible with, with the local reporters wherever I am. I think, uh, you know, I'm very fortunate in many ways to work for Bloomberg, but I think Bloomberg has a really good record 
of elevating uh, local talent from the places where it does operate. And in many cases, uh, those journalists end up taking up posts abroad uh, and become foreign correspondents themselves uh, in other people's countries. Uh, so, but yeah, look, it's a struggle. And I think it's something that um, our business will ultimately figure out probably in different ways that, than we have so far. I think the model of the traditional foreign correspondent uh, parachuting in from New York is, is probably, if not over, coming to an end. Hi, um, uh, Wall Street Journal. So um, I'm curious, Matthew, if you could share a bit more about how do you convene sources to share information? How do you motivate them, especially in countries, for example, China, where there's not much down, that there's not much upside talking to Western media, um, while there can be a risk of being arrested. Um, yeah, you can share everything with us. Uh, China's a tricky one, uh, as anyone who's worked in China will know. And, and I think there's been a noticeable difference in China, even in the last year or two, or let's say since the start of COVID, where people are much more reluctant to speak to international media than they used to, even on stories that are pretty uncontroversial. Um, what I try and say is I go at stories as stories in the narrative sense. Like I want to know what happened in a specific case. So uh, an example is, um, well, the book I did is about a, uh, a very complicated fraud that uh, in which somebody who appeared to be getting in the way of the fraud was murdered uh, and his murder was never solved. Tons of people were terrified of talking about it. Um, in that case, you know, I had, I had a moral argument, which was, look, something terrible happened. Uh, I'm trying to bring it to light and you can help me do that with your identity protected and all that. But actually the, the tactic I found most effective over the years, which is a little sharper elbowed, is just to say, look, I'm writing this. Either your perspective can be reflected or not, but you're not, your, your participation has no effect on whether this thing will appear. Uh, your non-participation, I mean, like you will not stop me doing this. And in the great, in the most, stark example of this like would be a right around profile right where you do a profile of a subject who's not cooperating and there are great examples of that um but generally you know that does get people to open up uh, certainly once they figure out that everyone else has talked to uh mm -hmm. then they, they start to get worried that you know everyone else's view or everyone else's recollection is going to be reflected and theirs isn't so you know with enough time and enough uh just being incredibly annoying uh <laughs> People usually talk, I find. Hi, um, I'm Claire from Bloomberg in Jakarta. Um, I wanted to ask both of you your process of refining your story ideas. How firm does your story lead your, or your hunch? How firm does it have to be for you before you decide this is worth seeking time and money into and it's actually feasible to pull it off? You go first. <laughs> uh, oh, that's very hot. That's very hard. Uh, most of the time, uh, I mean, this kind, of, the, this kind of hunch is sort of developed over the years, I feel. Uh, so the moment I see a potential story, I, I sort of look whether there's, I, I, look, I sort of look at it and see whether there's enough breath, uh, whether there's enough room to make mistakes for, uh, for discovery, for other things, right? Uh, and usually, uh, most people think that the best pictures are the ones that, that are most well thought out. But actually, the best pictures are the ones that are the simplest, the most simple ones, because they leave so much to be explained and so much to be desired. So for instance, uh, my uh, noise neighbor story, uh, I have to admit that I got that story from TikTok. Through mindless, endless night scrolling, I dedicate every night 30 minutes before I sleep to scroll TikTok. And I always, and then because of TikTok's beautiful algorithm, once you watch more than 10 seconds of something, that's all they will show you. So if you want to change your algorithm, don't watch something for too long. So uh, I, I keep scrolling and I keep seeing this lady's uh, TikTok, right? And I thought, it's been three months. How is it that you are still having this problem? Right? And there, then everything just laid out. So uh, that's how I refine uh, the pitch ideas. That's not to say that all the pitches work out. 
uh, currently, I, I'm going to follow your advice with the uh, uh, with how to get the, the with with how to get sources to sources to talk because right now I'm working on a story that is like super sensitive, and not many people are wanting to talk to me, so I'm going to try that. Uh, but I am I'm I'm wondering now as I'm talking whether this story can work. I doubt. I always doubt uh, until it gets written. So I'm not sure uh, whether a story will work or not until it gets written. But most of the time, I will go by instincts. Yeah, sometimes so the writers feel a bit uh, jaded or they feel very like, ah, oh, this is taking too long. People are not talking to me. I'm dead. I have no nothing. I have nothing. I have no nothing. Everything is done. So that's when we have to decide. Maybe it really is done. Or maybe the writer is just tired and needs a break. Yeah. So that's how I look at story angles. So my super secret brilliant tactic for finding stories is I just read The Economist. <laughs> uh, no, seriously, I just read the news. And, and something floats by and you're like, that sounds crazy. Someone should do more on that. Uh, and occasionally, I also read, there's a great um, publication called The Diplomat, uh, which mm -hmm. covers Southeast Asia in like it's insane detail. Uh, and I've come across a couple of things in there uh, that seemed like they were worthy of, of going much deeper on. Um, I, my screening tactic is I, I'm in awe of reporters who can take like a big amorphous subject, like a big social ill, you know, and say, okay, I'm going to go from the big topic to a bunch of uh, concrete stories that illustrate the big topic or what's wrong with it or, or what needs to change. Uh, I've only ever really been able to do things that are extremely specific. Mm -hmm. uh, one event, one person, one place, one company, one election, one moment. Uh, in my wearing my editor hat, uh, I basically reject all pitches that are not super specific uh, because I find, particularly at the lengths I work at, you know, which tend to be sort of five to seven thousand words. Um, you need to go really deep on one thing, whereas something big and amorphous somewhat paradoxically, typically benefits from compression. Like The Economist is this incredible exercise in compression where they take these big, important, complicated topics and boil them down. Uh, I actually find what makes great features anyway, which is the business I'm in, are taking very limited topics that kind of have four walls and, and blowing them up uh, really big. Uh, so that's how I do it, basically. But I certainly get it wrong and, and do things that start things that don't work out or, or execute <laughs> stories that don't turn out as well as I want it. I'm Kritika, I'm Hi, I'm Kritika. I work for the Associated Press in Delhi. And my question flows from what Stella was asking. I mean, India is not as closed as Turkmenistan, but um, government officials particularly are increasingly suspicious of Western press. Um, and of course, you know, um, in some work I've done, I've relied on open source data to get some information. Um, but at least the AP, there's this need for almost always trying to get a comment from officials. Um, and most of the time, you know, we really um, hold back from unnamed sources unless it's breaking news situations. I just wanted to know if you had, well, not just advice, but if you had any success in convincing reluctant officials in countries where press freedoms are especially low to speak uh, with you and on the record if there was any situation where something you did actually really worked out well. Um, I would struggle to think of a specific example, though there probably is one. Um, I guess I would, my instinct would be to go with a variation of like, this is happening anyway. Uh, and, and either you're in it or you're not. That seems to work, particularly because if, it's, if something's going to get a lot of attention, you know, as an AP story, very well, very likely will, uh, that could be a source of some embarrassment. You know, maybe not in B BJP run India. Maybe they just don't care, uh, in which case that argument's not going to work. And, and this is kind of where I come back to, like, being realistic about what's possible. Uh, we are living in a very difficult era, uh, and sometimes it's just you just have to go around or, or find something else to work on. Hello, my name is Mohammad Daoud Khan, and I'm from Pakistan. 
I'm a friend and radio journalist. My question from Zat is that uh, that uh, you are doing a great long form journalism, which is the essence of uh, journalism actually. But how you can survive in the age of TikTok and the digital uh, era, like everyone are going too short. So how do you manage that? Because it required time, it required funds. So how you manage all these things? I'll let you know. <laughs> I'll let you know when we have the answer. So essentially, uh, yeah, that is something that's, that, that is true. When I published my story, it was 5,500 words long. And every uh, part of my body right, is telling me, shorten it. Cut it. You're being too, too egoistic. Cut your story. Uh, and don't cut your story. Yeah, but don't cut your story, yes. But eventually, I just sat, sat in front of my computer and I paced up and down for 30 minutes, right? And I thought, no, publish. Yeah, this is very fast. So uh, I think what matters, with, uh, for, especially for Singaporean, for Singapore readers, right? Uh, who are all on TikTok and we are all on TikTok as well. I think what makes a good story readable is if it is written well. I cannot emphasize that enough. Uh, some people, uh, some of the uh, other publications in Singapore, uh, they say like, oh, nobody reads, you know, nobody reads anymore. And I will tell them, nobody reads your things. <laughs> nobody reads the things that you publish because have you seen what you write? Right? You have to be clear. You, it, is, it takes a little bit of a, of a literary mind, right? To really, like you think of the, of the last great story that you read, and you have to find a way to get people to believe in that as well. It's very hard. It is very hard. And I have to reach out to Singaporeans who are ordinary Singaporeans. One of the recent stories that we published was about a realtor, a Singaporean realtor who sold uh, an entire floor at Suntec City for close to 2.8 million. So my writer managed to find a contact who managed to contact this guy and she followed him around for close to three days. And the whole story came out and... Uh, everybody read it. Someone came up to me at one of my shoots, right, and said, your Zat, is it Rice Media? I said, yeah. Uh, my wife sent me your story, the, the realtor. I said, if my wife sent me your story, that means your story is successful. I don't try to write difficult with difficult words. I don't try to use big words, you know, especially with the Singaporean audience. But we have to make sure that the story is interesting enough and well-paced. I think it really has to be well-paced. So that's the, if you want to know the secret to getting people to read, that's the secret. Singaporean audience. I don't know whether they're the same as international audience, but that's what I noticed. Because honestly, our pieces are all 2,200 words and more. Yeah. Uh, hi, Ben Westcott from, um, from Bloomberg. I had a question for both of you, but each, each of you, one each. Um, Matthew, uh, one of the, I think one of the hardest things for journalists is often source building. And I'm sure for someone who is a, a long form magazine journalist around the world, it must be even, you know, it must be a real daily challenge. Can you give us any, what are your favorite tips on source building? And uh, for that, I, I think local media is some of the, is in many ways possibly even the future of journalism. And I, I thought to some of the ways you were talking about your job so fascinating was like amplify, offering solutions, like raising voices. How do you think that your sort of work fits in with these sort of old traditional notions of objectivity in journalism in terms of like sitting in the middle of like, oh, this is this and this is this, but you seem to be taking a more passionate approach to your work. What does objectivity sort of mean to you as a journalist? I'll let you answer first. Sure. Uh, yeah, I mean, my current role is a bit difficult in that uh, I typically do things that are one and done. Uh, you know, I don't have a beat. Uh, I don't return to the same people over and over again. Uh, I did, however, spend four years that, that took decades off my life uh, covering M&A and investment banking for Bloomberg in London, uh, which is a really tough job. Uh, and part of that is you have to develop a big network of, of bankers and lawyers and PR people uh, to tell you what's going on. Um, and I found what really worked there was not being transactional about it. Uh, it was spending a long time courting people uh, and also to try and be useful to them. You know, if, if someone's calling you to ask you what you know about something, uh, that's probably a sign that you've convinced them that you, you, you know, might be worth hanging around with. 
Um, the other thing that that kind of surprised me, um, I learned two two very important journalistic lessons in that job. Um, one is that people lie, uh, and you know they will lie all day long. Uh, they will lie if you think you're friends. They will lie when it's not in their interest. Like so, I think I, I got a bit of um, healthy skepticism uh, of what I'm told from that gig. The other thing that was remarkable, kind of a happier lesson is that even if someone uh, stiffs you the first 20 times, you try and get something out of them, number 21, they might help you out. Uh, and I actually had a few experiences like that um, where not writing somebody off turned out to really be quite, uh, quite a good choice. And I think probably I didn't have any great, uh, brilliant insight about not writing them off. I think I was probably just too nice. And, <laughs> I was like, oh, you know, maybe next time. And sure enough, sometimes next time arrives. Objectivity. Objectivity. Uh, I think the, so uh, what, what Rice Media represents in Singapore, uh, we have an opportunity to create a new product, right? So this new product is not uh, broadsheet based. It's not traditional media, but it is also not uh, TikTok. It's not Instagram, not social media. It is a combination of both, right? So when we talk about objectivity, uh, I, I don't believe that uh, we can't be passionate and, and be the voice for the voiceless without being, uh, and, and not be objective. I think it can exist at the same time. But then again, objectivity depends on who is looking at the objectivity-ness of, of that topic. For instance, uh, uh, I always tell my writers uh, in Singapore, the people who are on the left hates us. People who are on the right hates us. But both needs us. So how do I manage that? It is easy to be a national broadsheet and, and accept that, okay, you know what? The left wing, the, the, the more liberal people will be like, oh, this is all government propaganda, blah, 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 blah. They can accept that. You know, it has been the, it's fine for them. But for us, how, how, how do we do this? If we, are, if we take a left, if, if we take a different approach from uh, people who are a little bit more liberal, uh, for instance, with topics like the death penalty or topics with 377A, it's so hard. So whenever you talk about objectivity, people always talk about uh, how do you not be so liberal and be a little bit more uh, uh, understanding of people who are a bit on the right. But actually, the problem that we have is the other way around. Because we are seen as being very liberal and very... Uh, uh, a very modern way of thinking, right? But so it is for me. That's 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 objectivity. The, but the, the struggle that I have with objectivity is who is looking at the objectivityness objectivityness of this topic. I cannot satisfy everyone. So if I can't satisfy everyone, I'll satisfy myself. Yeah. <laughs> I, uh, I'm Brain from uh, Nikkei. I'm based in Kuala Lumpur. So first of all, both of you guys are doing a great job in journalism. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Matthew, I have a question for you on uh, how do you build the story, uh, the process of building, pitching the story maybe to your editors, uh, to your bosses maybe? And uh, what kind of precautions do you take before embarking on a story, um, particularly maybe the Turkmenistan story? What kind of precautions did you take? And uh, also, um, how do you deal with governments uh, which can sometimes, you know, be uh, very ruthless to reporters? You know, how do you, how do you deal with these people? And uh, to that, uh, I think uh, I want to ask, what happened to the lady who was suffering uh, for 11 years? Did, did her problem got resolved? And, and when you write about people's problem, right? Do you guys follow through until the solution or you just report it and then it's up to the authorities to settle the problem? Uh, I'll, I'll try and take that mm. quickly. Um, so in terms of pitching, I, I mean, I'm, I answer to editors who are in New York, so I need to uh, make a case for why a story uh, in some other part of the world is important to you know, a largely US and UK audience. Uh, so that's something I keep top of mind in a pitch. Uh, sometimes things are just, you know, big and dumb and obvious. It, like, uh, you know, an example where 
these two um, pharmaceutical billionaires were murdered in Canada uh, in 2017. Um, and it was a huge story. It was this crazy mystery. I was still based in London at the time, so it was practical to do it. Um, and that was like not much of a pitch. It was just, hey, you know, pharmaceutical billionaire murdered. Let's go do it. Okay. Uh, you know, Xi Jinping profile, like that would be a big obvious pitch. Uh, the ones that are a little trickier, you know, I do have to do a little more writing to uh, convince my superiors why something's important and why it's important to them. Uh, so I would do, you know, a five or 700 word pitch with some reporting behind it. Um, that sketches out what I want to do in terms of precautions and dealing with governments, totally case specific. Um, you know, as I said at the beginning, you know, one of the ways in which I'm privileged is that at the end of the trip, I come back here uh, and I don't have to live in whatever country uh, these challenges may exist in. But, you know, obviously all the usual IT security stuff I do, I'm two factor everything. I uh, keep things on the Bloomberg corporate systems as much as possible, which are ultra secure. Um, and, you know, coordinate with local journalists and tap as much local knowledge as I can on uh, what we can do to take precautions, what the red lines are likely to be, you know, what the worst thing that could happen is. Um, but, you know, I'm just, a, I'm just one reporter. Uh, I really am, am greatly in debt to my collaborators in whatever country I have to be working in for all that stuff. Have you faced any kind of harassment, and what's the biggest threat that you're facing? Um, nothing massively serious. Uh, certainly, on my book, my co-author and I were warned about threats to our safety uh, on a few occasions, um, and we've had to be careful about where we go and who we meet with. And um, there is one country in particular, uh, home to the antagonists of the book, uh, where I will certainly never go again. Um, and that's on advice from people who, who know. Um, but no, I've never had anything super serious. Um, you know, I, I worked um, on a recent story with someone in Saudi Arabia, uh, which is a really fantastic piece about Neom, this, this new city. Uh, you know, and there, there are certainly risks of harassment to international reporters, um, particularly to women, you know, who often get the worst of this stuff. I think probably more than often, almost always get the worst, certainly along line harassment. Um, but I've been, I've been fortunate uh, in, in not having to deal with too much of it. Uh, so what happened with the lady, right? Uh, after the story broke, a lot of people messaged me on LinkedIn. So I had uh, one message from a lawyer, a, pre, a, pro, bono, a pro bono lawyer, uh, who said that uh, he wanted to help uh he wanted to help uh help her with some of the issues that she's having so i just got him in contact but whether we follow up and whether we see whether there's anything uh whether whether things have gotten better right uh i think given the kind of uh as i mean we are one we are i am just one writer and we are just one small tiny little publication right so the best that we can do is to ensure that the story gets told uh, in the best possible way, in the most accurate way. And uh, because before I wrote this story, uh, the story has already been carried by uh, several other publications, but very briefly, you know, more as like a clickbait, more as like a uh, look at this sensational thing, look at this poor woman, oh, poor thing, poor thing. But for me, I really went into the, 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 the story and talked to the neighbours. I will never forget the night that I went around to each house and slipped a letter under each door asking them to speak to me. So I wrote a letter in all the languages in Singapore and I slipped under each door. And I was so scared that this neighbor who was making the noise, right, would see me. So I was just like, quietly at 1 a.m. in the morning, just slipping things into the, un, un, under people's door. God, people, if, if anyone reported me, I would completely understand why. So, uh, yeah, so back to the point is that uh, what, what we can do is create what, what I can do or what, can, what my writers can do is to just create this story that she can take and bring with her. So she can go to a member of parliament and say, look, this is my story. Read it. This is what I'm suffering from. There's no, they are telling me the story. This is the way it is being told. And uh, I, like, I like it. I like it because uh, it means that 
someone in the government, someone in the someone within the authorities are actually they actually know that it's happen something's happening. A minder somewhere or an assistant in some office, in some MP office, they know what is happening because all these members of parliaments were being tagged in all the Facebook comments, in all the Instagram comments, in all the TikTok posts. They were being tagged. So uh, that much, uh, that's as far as I can take the story. Yeah. I have a quick question. Uh, do, uh, uh, how friendly are the existing laws and rules uh, for a reporter uh, here? Uh, do you enjoy press freedom here? And another quick question that is linked to Prem. Uh, do you face any legal threats here uh, for your re reporting to on critical issues? You'll know way more than I do. <laughs> oh God! <laughs> uh, ah. it, it's like this. It's like this. Uh, as long as you don't lie or you don't create things that are not true, or you accuse someone of something without evidence, you'll be fine in Singapore, from what I notice. So yes, people, uh, yes, you can get arrested for the most uh, minor intrusions, right? Uh, but in terms of whether we can do our job as journalists, uh, that's the reason why uh, when we covered uh, uh, when we covered the Raisa Khan versus uh, the PAP committee of inquiry, where uh, there, there was a member of parliament who lied in, uh, in parliament and she had to go through a hearing. So we covered that story and we covered it from both sides. So we had the pro uh, Raisa Khan and then we had the pro government side. And on that same night that we published it, one of the media publications in Singapore were told to take down their article. So I went into a state of panic. So I spoke to both my writers. I called them and said, you check and make sure that your stories are all airtight. And I realized that that's, that's how I manage it. I made sure that if it's an opinion, is the opinion validated? If it's, a, if it's your own point of view, is your point of view correct? If you're, are you, did you say anything wrong about anything? Are you maligning anyone's character? So this, are how I, this is how we manage uh, the, the, the press laws in Singapore. But the fact that we still exist, I'm not too sure. I'm not too sure what people would say about that. They might say that, oh, Rice Media is a sellout. Right? I'm not too sure. But I think what is important for us is to just tell uh, the stories that matter and to make sure that uh, we do it in collaboration with ministries. Uh. Especially if the ministries are the ones that are supposed to help them, right? To help them get better. So why not work together with them? Yeah. And then we have uh, one final question from a fellow who couldn't be here right now. He said, how can an independent journalist exist in terms of job and security while there are corporate interests in the newsroom and li limited press freedom? Which I realize is a big question. Well, you, you. Uh, well I, I guess it depends on what you mean by independent journalist in the sense of being totally solo freelance. I think that's very challenging. Um, one of the cool things about the last, I don't know, 10 years has been the explosion of media organizations doing things in new ways and uh, from different uh, angles. You know, in the US, there have been some really great examples, ProPublica, who have, I think, certainly expanded to Europe. I don't know if they really have a presence in Asia yet. I don't think so, but eventually they will. Uh, you know, another great American example is the Marshall Project, which is a, a nonprofit uh, specifically focused on criminal justice issues. So, you know, I think the the old binary of either you're working for the New York Times or one of its peers, or you're a solo freelancer, uh, has changed somewhat. That said, these places tend to be financially unstable. You know, BuzzFeed uh, had, did a lot of very ambitious investigative reporting, uh, and I think is is largely withdrawing from that part of the business now. Um, but yeah, I think uh, the only advice I can give someone who works for a, a large media organization is, yeah, attach yourself to, to people who share your values. 
uh, and can help provide the resources. Uh, and there are more of those than there used to be. My, my, my advice would be to tell stories that make you uncomfortable. Uh, so I, have, I used to have a writer who is very political uh, leaning. So he loves writing about political stuff. He likes to write about politics versus the policies. You know, policies are the ones that affect the everyday life, but politics is something else altogether. So he loves writing about politics. And uh, he did ask me this question, like, what's, what's, what's my future? What do you think? What do you think I can do in future, right? Because he likes to do this kind of like, independent writing. And I said, the most important thing for you to do, right, for you to explore and for you to illustrate is that you can write beyond your comfort zone. And your comfort zone is politics. So tomorrow, write, write, uh, uh, write for me about it. Uh, write for me about uh, an LGBT event. And it is so outside his comfort zone because he's a Christian boy. You know, he's very upright. You know, very have not, have not seen the world. And I, I made him go to a forum about uh, LGBT, uh, the, uh, about the LGBT community organized by two religious faith groups. Yeah, so he's like, oh my God, what am I supposed to do? Yeah, but he did, he went, and it really opened him up, right? Then from there, uh, he started to feel more comfortable writing about other topics other than what he's used to. And, uh, and it all started with him being an independent journalist who's just very one, one narrow street down uh, politics, right? And now he's looking for a job as a comms, uh, comms person, and he realized that, oh, actually, there are more to life, right, than this particular topic that you are interested in. So even for myself, uh, I, am, I write these kind of independent stories, but I'm also not above writing for grab or uh, writing stories or writing slides, slide presentations for cleaning companies. I'm not, I'm not beyond that. I can write it. Uh, my passion, of course, is in telling these kind of stories, but I don't think we should be like a one-track writer. Yeah, and I think to end it, right, uh, oh, this is such a responsibility to end a QA. and a <laughs> To end it, I think yeah. we cannot uh, think that there is no value in the written word. The fact that sources don't want to talk to us means there's value in the written word. If all sources are talking to us, right, then we're like, oh, you're fine. Ah. Yeah, I'm fine. So what's, 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 what's the challenge? What's the point then? So people are still afraid to be quoted. People are still afraid to be... To, to, to be identified because they know the power of the, of the spoken word. And the fact that we are all still here in this room with so many countries coming together, right, it means that the spoken word, the written word still matters. And I don't want people to forget that. Yeah. Matt and Zat, thank you so much for this conversation. Thank you.